Okay, let's get started. So my name is Matthew, and this afternoon we'll be talking about uh, hardware-assisted tracing on um, RM SOCs using CoreSight and the Open CoreSight decoding library. So the goal of this presentation here is not to uh, show you how the presentation work, but really go over um, uh, how to use it. So the idea is to give uh, a general overview of the technology so that when you get to start using CoreSight on your platform, you have an idea of uh, what to look for, the terminology is fresh in your head, and you kind of know uh, how the pieces connect together. So uh, the emphasis will be placed on the integration that we have done with the Perf Core, so that happened over the last year. And um, we'll also be introducing the Open CoreSight decoding library uh, in the course of it as well. So uh, the presentation will start with a brief introduction on what CoreSight is. From there on, we'll be looking at uh, the required pieces that are um, needed to get CoreSight going on a platform. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll, be go, we'll go over what the Open CoreSight decoding library is, and we'll finish with uh, scenarios on trace acquisition and decoding. So if you go online or if you're looking uh, at the documentation, you will find that CoreSight is an umbrella technology that encompasses all the tracing need uh, of an SOC. So we're talking about single step debugging, JTAG, IDE, and in there as well uh, is hardware assisted tracing. So the idea behind hardware assisted tracing is to record the instructions that a CPU is using without impacting uh, what's currently happening uh, on the CPU. Everything that we have done so far is uh, upstream, so all of the kernel part is already uh, mainlined, and everything is found under drivers, hardware tracing, core site. So under there, you will find uh, drivers for the various IP blocks. You also see uh, the framework that glues everything together, and um, as I mentioned, the integration with core site. Everything is there concentrated under that directory. So hardware-assisted tracing works by coupling uh, an IP block called an embedded trace microcell with a CPU. So there's typically one one-to-one uh, -one mapping between an ETM and a CPU. And once the operating system has programmed uh, the IP block, uh, there's actually no uh, inter interaction that happens between, um, or that the, there's, there's nothing needed that is, uh, in order to get tracing going and recording. So you program the, the IP block, you launch the traces, and from there the CPU is not even aware of that uh, traces are being collected. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the goal is to uh, not impact what's happening on a system while uh, tracing, but in order to do that, we have to be mindful of the use case that uh, is currently under consideration. For instance, if we, are, um, if we have a trace scenario that involves a lot of DMA and we select an IP block, a core site IP block that dumps the trace data into memory using DMA, then obviously we'll have contention, right? So there's always a way to make sure that this doesn't happen by selecting different pieces of the, to the topology and making sure that nothing gets impacted or the current processing doesn't get impacted. So this is a, a fairly simple depiction of what a core site system is, and yet uh, quite accurate and representative of what people would find uh, on their platform. So on the far right, we have uh, the cores that are coupled with uh, an embedded trace macrocell. And the colors represent the, uh, the ID that the, the macrocell will introduce uh, in the packet that they generate. So there's um, a specific and unique ID uh, per macrocell. From there, the packets flow through the core site architecture all the way to the sink where they are collected. So when it's time to decompress traces, um, these packets, the packet IDs are used to split out the different streams that were collected. We feed everything to the open core site decoding library, and in the end, we get um, traces that are being decoded. Program flow trace is a term that you will find often in the documentation. It refers to the format that gets generated by the tracers. The idea is to record only uh, the events in the code that are moving the instruction pointer around. So if you start executing here, and at one point you understand that the instruction pointer uh, moved from this place to that, the only thing you have to record is when you started and when the instruction pointer jumped. 
Everything in between can be inferred simply because they are just instructions. So waypoints are those events that I just talked about. So branch instruction, exception, uh, return events, these are recorded and they are fed to the um, OpenCSD library. And in return, we get back executed instruction ranges. And these ranges, coupled with the original program image, allow uh, one to easily pick out the, the, uh, the path that a CPU has taken through the code for the trace scenario. So when looking at a co um, at core site or enabling core site on a system, um, there's a few things to consider. So the first thing, um, everything that we have done so far is supported upstream. We don't have uh, support for CTI, so cross-trigger interface and ITM. The cross-trigger interface is the IP block that uh, allows um, core site uh, devices to synchronize with one another. And the ITM is an older uh, specification. So if you have an ITM on the board, I simply look at the examples that we have for the more advanced tracers like ETM v3 and ETM v4, and you skim out the stuff that are not needed, and quite quickly you could get uh, assist, uh, a driver that supports ITM. I didn't provide an ITM driver simply because I didn't have any hardware. So I currently maintain uh, two platforms upstream for core site, so ARM, um, the VXpress TC2 for V7 and Juno for ARM V8. And between these two, um, we are covering most of the cases that are found for core site. So most of the, technology, the topologies that you will have on your board are more or less covered or provide uh, enough examples are provided with these two platforms in order to give out an, a good example on, on how to do things for your platform. When we're talking about core site, everything is um, uh, platform dependent, so the topologies will have different ways of configuring things. That's why we've decided to push everything to the device tree. So in there, I simply lists the devices that you have using the bindings and um, the graph bindings that were used for uh, video for Linux are reused here in order to uh, uh, tell the framework what kind of topologies we have uh, for a specific SOC. And when you have that, well, things should just work. But as usual, the detail, uh, the devil is in the details. So there's two things to really uh, keep in mind when looking at core site, so clocks and power domain. So core site blocks are uh, found on the AMBA bus, so your APB clock will have to be present in the device tree and manageable using the clock API. So if that is there, uh, no problem, the drivers will do the right thing, so they'll enable the clock uh, when they require access to um, uh, functionality provided by the IP block, and we'll switch it off after. The harder part is with power domain, where we have IP blocks that are split different, um, uh, during, uh, over different power domain on the platform. So typically, the, the funnel replicators and the sync will end up in the debug power domain, whereas the tracers will end up sharing the same power domain that the CPU they are uh, coupled with. And usually that will end up being a cluster power domain. The problem is that when CPU idle decides to put uh, the CPU in a deep sleep state, everything that happened on core site gets switched off as well. Right? So synchronization uh, on a power domain that is shared between a CPU and a device is definitely a problem. And right now in the Linux kernel, uh, it is not addressed. Lena Iyer is, has published a framework to do that. There is good work doing in that area, and I intend to um, adopt that framework as soon as it's available and merge it upstream. But right now, I simply decided not to do or, or to introduce any synchronization in mechanism in the drivers that are upstream, simply because people would have to take that out before putting their own synchronization mechanism. So right now, uh, the drivers simply assume that CPU idle is disabled, and I suggest you do the same if you are starting to work with uh, core site. So um, by disabling CPU idle, you will get going quickly. You will understand how the pieces fit together, and from there, uh, if you want to introduce your own uh, synchronization solution, by all means. Uh, but as I mentioned, I intend to incorporate the work that is currently be being done on uh, power domain synchronization as soon as it's available. So if we have uh, our clock and our power domains have been synchronized, uh, the top part of the, uh, the slide here, that's Juno booting. So on Juno, we have six CPUs. They're all ETM v4. 
So only the, 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 uh, the tracers will tell you that they're alive. All of the other blocks in the topology, uh, they remain silent at boot time. So if you want to know what devices, if you don't have access to the device tree or you want to know what devices were uh, instantiated at boot time, simply look at um, in SysFS. So the core site bus will list all of the devices that it's taking into account. And that remains for, uh, that doesn't go away, basically. It's always available. So now that we had drivers and a framework, we quickly understood that uh, we'd have to provide ways for people to uh, access the technology um, by uh, automating a lot of the configuration that is inherent to uh, tracing uh, with CoreSight. There's literally dozens of registers to set up for even the simplest uh, session. So integrated with Perf, uh, it was easy for us. The framework was already geared toward tracing. Uh, it allowed us to hide a lot of the complexity that is inherent to CoreSight. And everything that we could not uh, stuff into Perf, uh, we simply pushed back to the open CoreSight decoding library, which we've also uh, integrated with Perf. So with a minimum of investment, um, you can get uh, trace decoding and, or trace acquisition and decoding using the Perf tools. Everything has been integrated properly. So how we integrated it with Perf? Well, we simply represented our tracers as uh, performance monitoring units. So from there, we can interact with the Perf core, and uh, Perf is not even aware that behind the PMU, uh, it's a core site a tracer. So that way, we were able to use the very tight control that Perf has given us, and um, also achieve zero copy between kernel uh, data that are acquired in the kernel, and then send out to user space. So um, with regards to the PMU, uh, users on a system don't have to do anything. If, when the framework boots, it will simply register uh, the new core site PMU with the, uh, the perf core. And from there, um, everything will work seamlessly. So the name that we have given to the PMU is CS underscore ETM. And this can be found under all of the devices that were configured in the kernel, uh, or all of the PMUs that were configured uh, at boot time. So, a sysbus event source devices will list um, everything that perf knows about. And in there, you will find CSETM, under which uh, a bit of a, an anomaly that we've introduced is a symbolic link uh, for tracers and the CPUs. And we did that simply because, from a user space uh, perf tools point of view, there's no way to know what CPU is coupled with what tracer. So by adding a symbolic link, it gave us um, that information quickly, and we could also uh, easily access the configuration for each tracers. OK, so with that, it basically covers everything that is required for people to know about the kernel side of the solution, um, which leads us to OpenCSD, so Open Core Site Decoding Library. It's simple. Uh, it's a standalone library that allows uh, anyone who has core site uh, traces to um, decode the streams. Uh, so it doesn't even have to be uh, coming from the Linux kernel or the framework that we have. Any core site traces on, on any SOC that conforms to the norm will be able to uh, be dealt with using the uh, OpenCSD library. So it's a joint effort between uh, Texas Instrument, ARM, and Linero. Uh, right now it supports, it's fairly comprehensive, uh, supports ETM v3, ETM v4, and PTM. There's also support for SDM in there, um, the MIPU protocol generated by the SDM uh, IP block. <clears throat> so as I mentioned earlier, we've, uh, in order to provide uh, people with an example on, on how to use the OpenCSD library, we've integrated with that with Perf. So um, not only are they examples in the library itself, but on top of that, we've provided people on, uh, an example on how to use in a uh, real system. If you're looking for uh, more information on that library, there's an in-depth uh, presentation that was uh, provided uh, in a core dump blog uh, earlier this summer. So the link is there. Mike Leach has written extensively on it. So if you're um, looking to spin off your own trace solution or want to have more details on, on how things work within the library, simply refer to that uh, core dump uh, blog. And it's definitely um, the right place to start. So now that we have um, drivers, a framework, everything has been integrated with Perf, and we are also able to uh, decode the traces, 
Um, it's time to put everything together. It's not hard, but there's just a few things to keep in mind. So obviously the first thing is to get the library itself. Uh, one thing to mention here is that uh, integrating with perf, so recompiling the perf tools is mandatory um, only on the system that will decode the traces. So on a target, typically for trace acquisition, the perf tools don't have to be recompiled. So on a host where uh, trace decompression will happen, uh, simply get the open uh, CSD library, stick to the master branch. This is where we have our latest and greatest code nowadays. So um, the code goes there and all of the stable uh, revisions are tagged, so the same way that we do for the Linux kernel. Um, the howto.md is a file that describes everything that someone has to know about this specific revision. So not only how to compile it, but also uh, what kernel revision is it synchronized with and some of the use cases that are required um, for trace acquisition and decoding. So there's a lot of examples there. But the reason why we have to keep the open CSD library in sync with a kernel uh, revision is simply because uh, all of the perf tools have not been um, upstream yet. So half of them have been upstream and the other half are currently working on it. And there's so much churn going into uh, the perf tool subsystem that from time to time the solution breaks and we have to adapt things in order to keep uh, the functionality that we provide. Um, so uh, you will also find kernel branches on GitHub. So those are all of the patches uh, in user space to support uh, the integration that we've done with perf. So we are looking to move away from that scheme when everything is upstream, but for right now that's just a reality that we have to live with. When integrating with the OpenCSD, so when uh, rebuilding the perf tools, look for, um, at the very bottom of the screen there, CSCTM decoder. So in the list of files that are being compiled, if you see this file, it means that um, the perf tools have correctly seen the environment variable CS traits on this core path. So that environment variable should point out, uh, should point to where the, um, the CSD library has been compiled. And if this is valid and um, Linux script is happy, then you will get the, uh, the CS ETM decoder. Otherwise, you will hit the stubs. And obviously, if you hit the stubs, proof tools will be compiled su su successfully, but you will not be able to do trace decoding. So just an easy step. Um, I mention it here because people tend to overlook it. Uh, simply instantiate an environment variable with, uh, that points out to where the library has been compiled. And from there, make sure that um, you're hitting the right uh, file rather than the stubs. And that way, you will be able to do trace decoding. So now that everything has been integrated and we have our perf tools, we can now proceed with trace, uh, trace acquisition. Because we have integrated with the perf core, the only thing we have to do is use the perf record uh, command the same way that we would do for any other event. Uh, the event name, so in this case here we have CS underscore ETM. Uh, between the slashes, those are the options that are relevant for a specific um, PMU. In this case here, uh, the mandatory, the only mandatory option is the sync. So um, we specified the sync simply because on um, a typical core site topology or a core site system, you will have more than one sync where to dump the trace data. And if you don't tell perf where to send it, then this session will simply fail because uh, the core site framework is not aware of where you want things to where you want things to go. So once you have specified the sync, um, the specific about what process to trace and how you want to trace that process is specified. So pretty much the same way that you would do for any other um, trace event using uh, perf. So once again, worth mentioning the, uh, the listing of all of the core site devices on a system. So if you don't know uh, what kind of sync you have or, or the name that you have given to that sync, simply refer to the listing under the core site bus and you will have the information there. When we're talking about core site and hardware assisted tracing, we have to be mindful that it generates a massive amount of data and uh, definitely um, advise to um, skim out some of the data only to concentrate on the areas that are of interest. Uh, 
So there's a few ways to do this. The first one is inherent to uh, perf. So using the U or the K option after the option after the uh, the specifics for a tracer will um, confine traces to either user space or kernel trace. Uh, even then, there's a, a lot of information that gets generated, uh, which is why we have decided to integrate with the extension of the filter framework that was already present in in perf. So two filters um, that we've decided to introduce, so address range filters and start stop filters. So if we're looking at address range filters to start with, um, so we have the first line, the first part of the command line is the same thing that we've seen before. Dash dash filter, we're telling perf that we are going to use a filter. So this is no different. The same thing can be done for uh, trace point filters. And after that, between the quotes, well, you tell, you specify the filter that you want to work with. Because we have an address range filter here, the keyword is filter. And uh, when we're talking about kernel uh, space traces, so the second parameter is the address and how many bytes you want to trace for. So the address is typically found in system.map that gets generated when the kernel gets compiled. Um, so you simply look at the, uh, the function that you want in there, the address that is related to it, you plug that in there, how many bytes you want to trace for, and voila, you have your address filter, or your address range filter. For, um, in user space, things are a little bit different. So again, we have our dash dash filter, but this filter specification is, um, as you see, a bit different. So the address that we have is a relocatable address instead of being the full address. So this is, uh, will typically be what you find um, on the output of an object dump command. So once again, the range, so how many bytes you want to trace for, and the full path to the binary on the system. That path is then used to uh, correlate the address that was mapped in RAM, and that information is fetched from the perf.data file that we'll see later in, uh, in a few slides. So address range filter works this way. We start uh, filtering here, we stop here. So everything that falls within that range will get traced. If the instruction pointer happens to go outside of the range, everything that happened there will not be traced. So start stop filters, if we use the exact same example. So if we start here, we have our range here. Everything that happens between a range and outside of the range will be traced. So the, um, to start, what triggers the trace is the instruction pointer being equal to the start address, and stop is when the instruction pointer has basically passed over the stop address. So it has uh, a lot of potential for, uh, it's a lot more inclusive, but also has the potential to generate a lot more traces. So here the syntax, again, we have dash dash filter. The start keyword uh, will tell CoreSight what address you want to start from, start again. The stop is um, followed, so the addresses are exactly the same way uh, for the kernel. If you go into the system.map, that's where you will find um, the information. Uh, Adrian Hunter at Intel is currently introducing a way to um, uh, specify the addresses with symbols. So if you simply have uh, the name of the function, uh, as soon as this work gets integrated, then things should just work without having to work with addresses. So if we're looking at the, the user space example here, uh, start, stop, condition are the same. Um, we specify, uh, again, our relocatable address, the path. But here I bring your attention to the fact that I decided to start tracing in one library and stop the tracing in the binary. So nothing prevents you from doing that. The frame is very flexible. Um, and uh, so an example like this would simply work on the system. Yes? Where is it specified that you jump stops at the range? Well, here it's a start stop filter because of the start and stop keyword. Okay, so on, on the very bottom of the screen here, I start working, I start tracing at a 72C in a library called libcstest. And the stop condition, it's in the main. Right, so you start somewhere on the system and you stop someplace else. This simply highlights that you don't have to confine tracing to a single binary or a single library. And you can have multiples as one, uh, multiple filters um, specification as well. Right? So only, here there's only one, but if you put a comma, you can specify as many as you have um, address comparators on your tracers. Yes? Uh, so you have user and, and kernel uh, yes. filters. What limitations and 
A very good question. Um, I haven't thought about that yet. That'd be really, really useful. I, the same thing would be useful for um, security as well. So how do you specify these addresses for the secure world? Yeah, so, so for, so if you would specify them the same, the same way I'd expect, uh, just to give a lot of space. Uh, but does the ETM hardware have the capability to filter on, on, uh, on addresses issued by something running at, uh, at high speed? Or is it something that you have to, you have to do software? So, uh, re repeat the question, please. So, who, who would be able to do the filtering? Is the ETM hardware able to filter directly the addresses executed at, at high, the instructions at high, or would you have to do that in software? No, I think it has the capability. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that would be really, really useful to uh, I understand. I understand. If, if, if only as a development option. <laughs> Absolutely. The, the security people have asked for the exact same thing, but for the secure world. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a puzzle right now. So there's, uh, I've been thinking that this, the current scheme is, is very likely flexible enough to support it. It's just a matter of making it support. Okay. Um, so the limitation on filters, as I mentioned, the, you can only filter as many, you can only specify as many filters as you have filter capability on your um, core site tracers. So this is important um, simply because every tracer will have uh, a different amount of um, address comparators based on the implementation. This will typically be found, um, well, it can be found at boot time in the um, information that the tracers expose via SysFS or simply ask the hardware designer uh, that worked on the system. And you should have that information pretty quickly. Other than that, we simply don't allow to have start and stop and range filters um, in the same specification in the tra same trace session. You can have as many start and stop filters as you want and as many address range filters as you want. You simply can't have them co-located in the same trace session. Other than that, uh, the scheme is very liberal. Um, it should, uh, I haven't been able to break it yet. Okay, so um, once again, the integration with Perf uh, gives us um, the possibility to work with things that are already there. So uh, anyone that has worked with Perf already uh, will be familiar with the perf.data file. So when you are starting to work with Perf, uh, with, uh, Perf and CoreSight, and if you want to know if your app CoreSight is alive on your platform, simply dump the perf.data file, and you will, uh, among other things, like you'll see all of the events, but you also see um, output of the packets that were generated. So it will look something like this. So the packets don't give you much about uh, what happened during a trace session, but at least it will tell you uh, that something has happened. Otherwise, you won't see any trace packets. Okay, so always a good place to start the perf.data file, uh, full of cool information along with the packets that were generated. So um, enough of theory, it's now time to look at an example. Um, I've decided to simply uh, show what we can do with CoreSight uh, using a very simple example. On the left side or on the right side, we have uh, a main. So the main is, is just calling one uh, example function, so CoreSight test one, and it prints the value that gets returned from there. And the um, CoreSight test one happens to be located in a library somewhere on the system. And the only thing that it does, it goes through a parameter five time, returns the value, and that's pretty much. So uh, using that, it's very simple and yet uh, fairly representative of what someone would want to do to debug something on a system. So here we'll concentrate on what's happening in the test function. And for that, well, uh, the first thing to do is grab the, the binary on the platform, submit it to object dump, and we see here that core site test one pretty much matches the address that we've seen before. So everything that we've seen before was based on this example here so that people can actually relate to uh, the examples with what uh, was presented in the, um, in the slides. So 72C is uh, the address of our um, test function. It's also interesting to note that because we want to use, I will be using an address range filter, uh, the function goes for about 40 bytes. So with this information, uh, we simply go back to our target. Uh, in the middle of the screen, we are specifying CSCTM, the, the sync that we want to use. Uh, 
Uh, we are using user space, so uh, we're tracing in user space uh, the filter uh, keyword, and from there, the specification of our filter. So 72C, we want to uh, trace for 40 byte and the full path to the library on the system. So uh, Perf will go to work. It will uh, interact with the PMU that will start the tracing when uh, the process is actually scheduled on the CPU. And from there, at the end of the session, you will end up with a perf.data file. And at the bottom of the screen, uh, we see that perf has uh, picked up about 8K worth of data. So it's that simple. So typically what will happen is that we will generate traces on a target and uh, package all of the trace data uh, for trace decoding on a host someplace else. When doing that, obviously the perf.data file is the first place or the first thing to package, but also the .debug directory. Why? Simply because under .debug, perf will put everything, all of the binaries and all of the information that was um, that pertain to the session that we just uh, went over. So here we have our um, kernel symbols. So this is typically the content of the system, not map. Uh, the VDSOs, um, the main for the session. So we have the full path to the main. The libraries that we use, so obviously the loader, libc. And uh, finally, on the far side, we have uh, libcsdes, which is the library that I have compiled for this example here. So all this is given to us by perf. The only thing that we have to do is pick it up, package it with the perf.data file, and off to a host for decoding. So once we, we picked up the trace data and moved everything to a host, uh, the first thing to do is probably start with perf report. So if you dump perf report, uh, if, you end up, if you dump the output of perf report to um, console using STDIO, you will get a flame graph of the hotspot that were um, recorded during the session. So this is just an indication of um, like somewhat what happened during the session because uh, perf report will use the address, the start address of the range. It won't tell you anything about the end of the range. So we have. Um, five ranges that started with the same address but did not end up at the same place, these will be aggregated together and presented to you as, um, like as a single data point. So it, it's a good indication of what has happened, but for more information, you really have to um, program your own script or use um, the built-in script feature uh, in perf. So this looks like this. So um, by default, uh, perf script will simply uh, give you all of the address ranges that were collected during the session. So in blue here, if you look at the addresses and you go back to the uh, output of the, the object dump output that we had for the library, we'll see that we started the function at 72C, some initialization was done, and then the loop over five time, and we return back to the main function. So because we decided to trace, or we told CoreSight to trace just this range, this is just the range that was picked up. Okay, so in blue we have the ELF or the relocatable uh, portion of the address. So we've seen that on the output of object dump. The um, the most significant bit though that's coming from the offset uh, where the library was mapped uh, in RAM at um, when the program was loaded. So this information uh, can be uh, gathered from the perf.data file. You look at all of the events that the uh, the mmap two events that were gathered for a session, you correlate the, um, the address and the full path to the library, and from there, by adding the two, you have the exact instruction um, in RAM where that instruction or the, where the specific uh, were executed. So as an example of what we can do with perf script, we've decided to uh, provide examples. So two examples that we have, the range script and, and the deassemble script. So the first part of the screen simply uh, shows you how to call the range script. Uh, you need a few environment variables, so that's why I've decided to show this as an example. Uh, but the range script will, will um, print information that's uh, fairly useful. So uh, the beginning and start of the ranges, and again, we see uh, where it started, where the initialization was done, uh, the loop, and then um, how the code got out of there and went back to the main function. So th these are basically instruction ranges that were executed. 
we want more information, and this is where the, uh, the power of scripting and CoreSight comes together, we can use the deassemble script. So all of these scripts, these two scripts are found on GitHub. So um, this is just the, um, I'm just showing here the way that they're being called, and the end result is here. So this script, uh, the deassemble script, was uh, programmed by Tor, uh, Jeremiahson at uh, TI in about two hours over lunch. And this is the, the end result. So uh, for each instruction range, we have uh, the file that was uh, executed in, the CPU it was executed on, and all of the instruction uh, in assembler that were executed for that range. And the, the same is done repetitively for all of the ranges that were executed. So by investing just a little bit, uh, you can get a lot out of the traces uh, that are generated. And this is just an example. There are tons of other information found in the synthesized uh, uh, blocks by perf that can be tapped in. So obviously there's a lot of things that I don't have time to talk about. Um, first thing I'd like to highlight here is that we've just seen an example on how to generate traces for uh, user space. The same can be done in the kernel, obviously. But um, if you are doing that for the kernel, be mindful of that the VM Linux file does not end up in the .debug directory. So you will have to pick that up either from uh, a compilation that you, have, uh, that you have as a reference or on the system itself. So it has to be part of the, um, uh, of the, uh, the trace or the, the, the information that needs to be collected in order to do trace decoding, and you have to manage it yourself if you are think it, looking at um, tracing in the kernel. So everything that, um, everything that is done was by design um, the same way for Intel PT. So the idea is that if someone is using uh, hardware-assisted tracing on one architecture, they don't have to relearn it for another architecture. So it simply follows the same framework and the same syntax. Everything, um, well, the framework and the drivers themselves are uh, highly focused on SysFS. So if you are looking at spinning off your, your own tracing solution, you will have to integrate with um, the registers that we expose in SysFS. And on the, um, the streaming side, everything that, um, so all the kernel space solution is there. We are, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of uh, perf tools that um, are going into 4.9. And the remaining, um, uh, so perf report and perf script, those will happen at later, um, later during later cycles. And as I mentioned, we are working on a CTI driver, so that should be coming uh, at one point or another in the uh, in, in in a month or two. So with this, um, this is the uh, the team that has worked with me on CoreSight over the years. And um, it is now time for your question. Uh, I would like to ask, um, uh, what, um, do you have some real example or case when it was useful for you? And, uh, more about uh, use cases and what what it it could be, what what it could be used for. Um, what it could be used for? It's it's basically right now. This provides a foundation for building on top of things. Mm -hmm. I know that it has been used at customer sites uh, or people that we have been working with for debugging uh, like a frozen system. Mm -hmm. So when the system stops. There's no output on the console. What happened? Where's the instruction pointer? Uh, so that has been very useful in that area. So it's because of the massive amount of traces that are generated, we have to understand that this is a micro solution. If you, if you end up generating too many traces, you're going to spend too much time looking at what happened. So you, you narrow down the areas that you think um, are problematic. And then from there on, using CoreSight, you can really see what the CPU has done for a specific um, problem. So you might have a glitch in the rendering. So why is it that the glitch happened? You know, uh, did we run out of RAM? Did we have a, a, a TLB miss? Uh, is the cache a problem here? So by really 
it, it, it's used to really pinpoint problematic areas that might be really hard to debug. Um, for instance, if you're working in a scheduler and at one point or another, Sting just stopped. So what happened? You know, things like that. Okay. And uh, could it be used for the um, performance? Com how to say, me measurement? Yes, so um, cycle accurate uh, is an option that we do provide and that could be used for performance uh, measurement. Actually, okay. I think some people, uh, there's a group at ARM that does just that. Mm -hmm. They used uh, cycle accurate in their diagnostic mm -hmm. uh, suite. Okay, and one more question about the, uh, could it be used for non-Linux systems like microcontrollers, Cortex and so on and so on. Absolutely, right? absolutely. The only thing that you have to, actually some people do that, uh, they have a, an RTOS somewhere on their platform and they stapled um, an ETM to it. Mm -hmm. So as, as, it, it doesn't matter as long as traces are generated and um, configured properly in the core site topology, you will end up with the traces uh, in the sync. And these traces can be correlated among all of the IPs that you have on a platform. They don't have to run Linux, as long as the configuration is conformant with the use the trace scenario. Uh, things will just work. That's okay. one of the, the advantage of using CoreSight, is that mm -hmm. you can do tracing uh, and correlate traces uh, on systems that don't necessarily run Linux. OK, thank you. Yes, I have two questions. Uh, one is um, the time stamping. The time you get, uh, is that uh, generic in core side? You use a general purpose uh, counter? Generated in hardware. So the core site hardware will generate the timestamps that you find in the packets. But is, is this something you have to configure depending on, let's say, on the SOC you're going? Uh, so you will have, to, there, there is some configuration that are specific to that clock. So, so you can, um, I don't know all the details in that area, but uh, uh, you, can, you can ask to have um, uh, a, 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 um, a timestamp generated in the stream at every X number of cycles. So this is the type of thing that you can configure. You get this out of the box, I mean, Yes. For example, if you use a OMAP5, or, uh, then you, you get a selection of four, a hardware counter, which you can configure, and depending on your, maybe on your uh, bootloader or you know, on your uh, um, uh, BIOS you're using, you will, will end up in different configurations for that. So the clock and the timestamp that is found in the packet is based on the clock that comes into the IP blocks. And this is typically the APB clock. There's, there's, another, there's another clock that you can use. There's two, there's two clocks that can be used. There's one, the APB clock, as I mentioned, and there's another one that can be coming from just any regular clock, any clock that you choose to have in the system. And that configuration time in the drivers, you can choose which, to, which clock you want to use for synchronization. There's information somewhere in the configuration of, of uh, the core site uh, framework. And so we, in the framework, we do um, in the bindings, there's a uh, specification for, there's room for two clocks, so the APB clock and the one that I just talked about. But right now in the drivers, we don't pick up the second clock. Like this is an enhancement that you would have to add, uh, probably a device three thing that would say pick up the second clock rather than the first clock. Thank you, and my second question is, um, well, currently we see that we are tracing code somehow. But the, I say, uh, if you look, the overall system, you have uh, embedded system running multiple processes and threads and so on. So typically when we use tracing, we use something like LTT and G. Uh, we see all the parallel activity on the course. So uh, it would be a, a real uh, a dream. <laughs> That, that you can uh, use the instrumentation which is provided in the kernel from, for LTT and G or for any other kernel tracer and have maybe part of it in, in the hardware tracing unit. And, uh, but I, I, I think this is, this is a long way for uh, going Correct. With that. Correct. So the idea is to provide building blocks that people can use to build what you just described here. So our, our, our main intention here was to provide a foundation so that, uh, that 
people can converge toward a focal point uh, in, in core site development rather than everybody doing their own solution. Uh, the, first, the first idea or first thing I, I would propose is having the scheduler just, uh, uh, just getting all the scheduler activity traced in somewhere in some hardware uh, buffers or in, in mm -hmm. these core site modules and you get a uh, um, accurate uh, scheduling uh, trace uh, of the system without uh, interacting or interfering with it. So if you want to trace a scheduler, CoreSight's probably not the best tool simply because of the amount of data that gets generated. Right? But if you're looking for con to trace all of the context swaps or the context swaps or the, the um, uh, whichever uh, uh, process gets scheduled at this very instance or what happens during the transition from one process to another, CoreSight would be ideal for that. And there's, uh, there's um, in specification, there's uh, room for a TPIU, so a trace port um, that interacts with uh, a port on the board and uh, a decoder box on the side. So it allows to export data in real time. So that way you can generate massive amount of data but not impact anything that, has, that you have on the system. How, how big is the internal uh, buffer memory for storing that? Uh, so it's a good question. On so that depends on the, the IP block that you're using for as a trace buffer. So it can get range from you know four to ten k uh, for memory that will be embedded into the the block themselves. There's also provision uh, and drivers that allow you to dump the trace dot into memory, uh, system memory that is. So um, it can basically be as big as your system memory, but then you can't do anything else on the system, which is why it becomes important if you. If you envision tracing anything substantial, it becomes important to just use a, a trace port and send everything out in real time to um, a host that actually has the memory and the capability to handle all this. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your talk. Um, uh, sorry if I missed. Um, could you share some, uh, your opinion about security implications of such tracing te uh, technologies. Mm, I mean, it may seem as a perfect rootkit if you just come to the system which runs and take, uh, install USB debugging tool and take the keys and go away without any trace. Right, so to trace uh, anything on the system, you need to have root privileges. So. Uh, as soon as you have root, then you can use core site. But as soon as you have root, you can do a lot more damaging things than just using core site. Mm. Uh, there are some tracing technologies which uh, don't even disturb uh, the operating system which runs on the box. So it just uses some hardware, mm, uh, hardware support from the processor which runs the operating system, which will uh, silently give you all the data about the running operating system and uh, the memory of it. What do you think about it? So what is the question? I'm not sure that I get uh, uh, where you want to go. My point is that uh, tracing technologies uh, have very um, hard security implications. And um, does it... Uh, is it considered when such tracing technologies are made for different architectures? Well, again, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure of, of, of the question. Did I consider uh, security in doing this? Uh, it depends on what kind of security we're looking at. Again, as, uh, as I mentioned, we, in order to trace anything, you need to have root. And uh, right now, it doesn't support uh, tracing um, everything that happens in the secure world. Mm -hmm. Other than that, there's no security other that is built in other than what Linux provides in terms of the normal generic security mechanism. OK, thanks. All right, have a good afternoon. Thank you.